Hey, y'all, welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. I'm your host, Heather McFadden, and this is the place where I get to walk alongside you and connect you with people and resources so you know that you don't mom alone. And in this episode number 330, I get to connect us with Dana K. White, otherwise known as a slob comes clean. The other key to that is just knowing where to start because it's a very real thing to look around your whole house and go, oh my goodness, how did this happen again? What am I going to do? I've got to change. Every method I've ever tried has failed, blah, blah, blah. If you will just know that when I'm overwhelmed, do the dishes. There's nothing to think about. It's just that, oh my goodness, what's happened? Do the dishes and you're going to be fine. Like it is an active thing that you can immediately do that will then you know, lead you to the other stuff. Or if, if it doesn't, like if you quit after the dishes, your dishes are done and your house is better. Managing your home in the midst of motherhood, work life, other family commitments and friend commitments is a challenge, especially if cleaning, organizing, and decluttering doesn't come naturally to you. I'm raising my hand. Well, thankfully, Dana understands. She is one of us. Years ago, she started a blog kind of outlining her journey of recognizing she was a quote unquote slob. And today she is sharing some tips on helping us, especially those of us who it doesn't come naturally, to have a place to start. How do we declutter a space? And if this is something that's more easy for you, maybe you live with someone that struggles, a child, a spouse, a parent that lives with you, and these tips could be helpful to guide them in their own decluttering, cleaning journey. I also thought, I know for ourselves after quarantine and now kids home from being back in school, it's just always a chaotic time with clutter, and so I thought her tips would be super helpful for us all. Let's get right to it. Here we go. Hey, Dana, welcome to the Don't Bomb Alone podcast. Thanks for having me on. This is fun. You've been doing this a long time, this whole talking on a podcast, Delio. How many years? Okay. Now that you're going to say that, I'm like, wait, how long has it been? (laughs) I think I started in, it was either 2011 or 2012, That's amazing. which is crazy. Like I had never listened to a podcast before I started mine. I was like, well, that sounds fun. I'll just, I'll just talk into a microphone. I love to talk. And my husband's like, all those years of you talking to yourself have finally paid off, you know? So (laughs) talking to yourself. Yes. I think that was my quote in my high school yearbook is that talk to yourself because you can always be sure someone's listening. Right. Right. Perfect. It's perfect. And the vast majority of mine are just me talking. Like I do (laughs) two people things now more often, but for years it was just me. No editing. I'm like, wow, I can't believe people listen, but Okay. (laughs) And we share an editor, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Shout out to Rachel who makes us sound amazing. Um, Tell us a bit about your journey. What was your pain point that led to you to call your podcast a slob comes clean? Because I think I'm going to really relate to you on a lot of this. I'm excited. So, I I mean, the pain point was me. I mean, it was my whole life of having been messy. I mean, I was the messy kid, the I was the one in high school. I opened up my locker and everything fell out, you know, and I hated being messy, but I'd always assumed that once I got married, it was going to matter to me in a way that it hadn't mattered before. And that I would, you know, (laughs) what could be that hard about it? You know, it's just, I'm just so busy. I was just always thought I had other things going on, other focuses. And then I got married and um, yeah, it didn't get any easier, but I still thought, well, once I have kids and I'm a stay at home mom, what else am I going to have to do? Right. And in reality, it became that much worse. And so before I had kids, I could do the nothing else for three days and clean my house from top to bottom and then have people over, you know, and even though it went right back to being a disaster within a day or two, you know, I could do that, but then you have kids and you don't have two to three days to four weeks to do nothing but clean your house. You know, I mean, it just, it's not reality. And so it became so much harder and it was now my identity. So like I had always thought before, well, you know, my home is not who I am. And so that's why this is so hard, but now it was my identity and it was even harder. And that was when I really thought, okay, there's something wrong with me. Like literally 
I am broken in some way. Like I cannot do this thing that other people seem to be able to do so easily. So really it, it actually started as a blog in 2009, um, which I still, it still exists and everything. Uh, but I started that because I wanted to write and I had been putting off starting it because, well, honestly, because of my house. I mean, I mean like, because I thought, no, this is going to be one more thing that I'm going to throw myself into. And then that's going to be something else to keep my focus off of my house. And I've got to get my house figured out first before I can do this thing. And that extra motivation that I felt like should have been, you know, I I always thought I just needed like a little click in my head and then it was going to change. And I thought, well, surely this is great, like great motivation. Yes. I'll get my house together so I can start this blog. Um, and I couldn't do it. Um, and so then really it was a moment of me crying out to God and saying, why have you not fixed me so I can do this thing you want me to do? Because I really felt like God was calling me to encourage other women. And God said, and I, I don't say that like lightly, you no, know, I, know. I mean, like, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not one to go around going, Oh, well, God, tell me this and God, tell me that. I'm like, <laughs> like, it was this moment of like, right about that. And I was wow. like, Oh, okay. So okay. So that's actually a really good idea. God. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, so I thought I this is God, <laughs> right. I was like, good job. And that's when the name came to me. Like I had never called myself a slob before. Yeah. And I didn't want to use that name, but I couldn't think of anything else, even though I was wanting to write like that was, and I was so desperate to get going on this thing. Cause I thought it was going to be like temporary practice. I didn't use my real name. I made a, a fake name and like, Oh, you were, you were early. Yeah. I remember those blogging days. Yeah. yeah we tell like our I children's no, names. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. Because I was also share. I was showing pictures of like okay. my embarrassing actual, what I was dealing with. And so like my worst fear was that somebody I knew was going to stumble on these and go, wait, is that Dana's house? You know? So, um, so you started writing before the problem was solved. You, oh, just, you wrote through the problem. I, I thought this was a way for me to learn about blogging and focus on my house. I thought, okay, maybe this would be the thing. And so I just, I was completely honest. I mean, once I called myself a slob, what there's nothing else. I mean, there's, there's no such a negative. Yeah. It's such a negative. It is a term. negative. Yeah, I mean, it's there's like no a, positive around no, slob. It's like fighting words. You know I mean? Like it's a major <laughs> insult, you know? And I didn't want to, like I said, I mean, like I had so many times said, it's not like I'm a slob. You know, I mean, mm. I'm chronically messy. I'm perpetually disorganized, whatever, but it's not I'm like a I'm a creative. Slob. That's what I say. Right. I'm a creative. This is just right. like what creatives do. Exactly. They're just like, like always making something, you know, and I mean, Albert okay. Einstein, his yeah. office. Have you seen it? I mean, yeah, that's just geniuses. proof. I'm brilliant. So. Yes. <laughs> We're so smart. We don't have time for these frivolous things like <laughs> cleaning. Yeah. Uh-huh. I've done the same thing. So it's like owning that. Yes. And it being negative. Owning it. But also the anonymous factor was important because it was anonymous. Yeah. And so it was like wearing a mask, you know, like, like back when I was the mascot in junior high and could act like a crazy person because there was just some, even though technically maybe somebody knew it was, you know what I mean? Like, there's just something that happens when you have that anonymity where you're like, well, what do I have to lose? Nobody knows I'm doing this. I didn't even tell my husband at first, you know, I mean, And it's a fake name. I had set up a new email address so it could never be traced back to me. You know, I mean, like that was the goal is I was like, what do I have to lose? I've called myself a slob. I've got to figure this out. And so I was just so honest, like just complete and not just like so honest with the world, but finally honest with myself. Mm. Like, this is what I'm doing. And then I would see something that needs to be done. And I would write about why do I resist doing this? Like, what is my... Mm thought process behind not doing this thing that really, when I would stop and think about it, I would think, well, that needs to be done. But you know, anyway, so it it worked in a lot of ways. Um, (laughs) How many kids, how many kids do you have? I have three. They were three, five, and seven when I started. Three, five, and seven. Cause I think the mom listening, like there's a lot of them right there. Like that's like right where my listeners are is that early elementary preschool and that overwhelm and kind of like yeah. another excuse of the baby years and the newborns and just the chaos. It's like, we're just trying to get through this. So the home is just on the back burner and I actually had a mom reach out recently. Cause I kind of in my head viewed my job as helping the perfectionist moms chill out. Mm-hmm. But this mom reached out and she said she grew up in a home where the women didn't do anything. And like, 
another negative term, lazy, was kind of just the mode of a lot of the women she was around, her mom and her grandma. And so like combating that in herself where she feels like there are things to do, she has the time and she's choosing not to do them. And I was like, oh gosh, well, I don't want to shame you. Like that sounds like an inner thing. And for you, it's like an inner, it's an inner struggle that you're describing. Like you are seeing the mess and you are having to process why. Right. So, so here's how I describe it because the okay. laziness thing is something that you have to, it is very easy to go, oh, I'm so lazy. When in reality, I was doing a lot more than I needed to be doing. I was just doing the wrong things. So I was constantly trying to make up for not doing the right things first. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I didn't, it, my brain sees things differently. So I call it slob vision. So the way I describe it is I don't see incremental mess. Like I see perfectly clean and I go, oh, I love that. And then I see, oh my word, this is overwhelmingly messy. I'm paralyzed now and I don't know what to do, but I don't see it happening. Like I don't see the few things on the counter and then the building of that. I just go, because I am very focused on all these other things that I'm doing. And so I, I want to be careful on the laziness thing. I think that there are a lot of people who kind of default to, I must be lazy yeah. when in reality, a lot of those same people are doing a lot of things. And so for me, it came down to identifying which things actually moved the needle. Because I had always viewed myself as a, pro I mean, I always, I am a project person, like give me a project and I will tackle it. But when I treated my house that way, the whole top to bottom cleaning, I mean, like I can do a top to bottom clean that will make your jaw drop. But the reality is that's not helpful. Like that does not help in the day to day. It actually makes things harder because that's just not living real life. Because when I would finish the project of my house being clean, then I would sit back and go, Oh my goodness, I'm exhausted. Yeah. And who I deserve to rest after having done, you know, like sweating buckets, you know, while I cleaned my house. And then my house just went back to being worse than it was before. And in reality, just doing the dishes every day, that ultimately changed my home in the way that these top to bottom cleans for two and three days at a time had never actually changed my home. It, yeah. It just sounds like energy management. Like you're talking about, like, like you said, people that quote unquote call themselves lazy. It's like, they are doing things. You're, you're managing your life in a way where you're expending energy, but not in what matters. Right. And then it's very frustrating because I mean, I, I, I can specifically remember at that age that before I started the blog or anything. So my kids were little, probably like I probably had two and they were two and four, you know, yeah. and I can remember one day crying to my husband and saying, I feel like I am running around working all day long on my house and there is nothing to show for it. And my husband is incredibly supportive, but I can remember the look <laughs> in his eyes as he was like, Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, and, and to go with that, <laughs> the sweetest thing my husband ever said to me after probably four or five years of the blog is he was like, he said, please don't take this the wrong way. He said, but I've realized there's actually something wrong with you. Oh. And I was like, that is so sweet. <laughs> it was like a huge compliment because he, what he went on to say was, he said, I've realized it's not because you're lazy. It is not because you don't care. He goes, and it was hard because for him, when he would live in our messy house, it's hard to not look at that and think that the person living there doesn't care. Do you know what I mean? He said, but I've realized you care so much, but you just literally didn't know what to do in what order and where to put your focus in your time. Speaking of cleaning, I'm thankful for this week's sponsor, Rothy's, not just because they make exceptionally comfortable shoes or totally sustainable or really, really cute and adorable, but they are fully machine washable. So I'm someone who doesn't own a lot of different shoes. So the ones I have, I wear frequently and with my slip-ons, I don't even wear knot socks, so they start to get a little stinky. 
thankfully, with Rothy's, I can throw them in the washing machine and they look great. And they last wash after wash. In fact, the average pair of Rothy's has walked about a thousand miles. That's like walking from San Francisco to Denver and staying comfortable with every step. And customers agree that Rothy's washable shoes are winners. Laura S. says, knowing that dirt will just wash away makes the white sneaker look possible for this mother of two. And Bobby B. never worries about her shoes because she can pop them in the wash and they look good as new. I agree, Laura and Bobby. So to keep it clean with washable shoes and bags from Rothy's, plus they just launched men's shoes. Hello, Father's Day. Make sure to check them out for the guy in your life. Head to rothys.com slash DMA, all caps, to find your new favorites today. That's rothys, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash DMA. Hundred percent. Like I, I relate to all of this. I struggle so badly with knowing, like, if if we're talking about decluttering, let's just take mm-hmm. decluttering. We're not talking yeah. about cleaning. I really struggle with what do I keep, what do I get rid of. I struggle with all the little decisions. It's all overwhelming to me. And when I had little kids are running around. I even didn't have a plan. So I was just reacting and responding to each of their needs. I wasn't yes. leading the train here. I was just <laughs> working for them. <laughs> like I was, and so to make a plan of I'm going to now clean the counters or the toilets or whatever it is, that was like nowhere in my priority list. My priority list was keep everyone fed and alive and meet whatever need they have at the moment. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, the house gets worse and worse. And the the longer it goes, the more overwhelming it is, which makes it harder to get started. And it's because of it's, it's because you have so many decisions to make, like every problem that you're solving for your kids, that's a decision that you're making. We are all right now in 2021 suffering from decision fatigue. I mean, because every little teeny tiny decision that used to be like, not a decision has been become a decision over the last year. And so So yeah, I had to learn how to make progress and make act, how to get started and make a real impact without using up all my decision energy in the beginning. So like, that's my whole decluttering process is you're going to get through a big part of it before you have to make any actual decisions. Um, And then you're going to see improvement and then you're going to then gain energy from the improvement that you see, which then lets you keep going. So did you see a shift in your relationships? Like prior to making this discovery, did you have a lot of people over? I did, but I had to have two weeks to be ready. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The like spontaneous drop-ins were terrifying. The spontane, yeah, they were terrifying is exactly the word. I mean, I would, you know, look for every way to avoid any kind of spontaneous drop-in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would, but I would also, um, I would volunteer to host something or whatever, because I knew I needed that motivation to get my house, you know, but, but then I would have it perfect. And my husband, I would look around, we're like, let's just keep it this way. And it got to be a joke where we would just like, "Ah," (laughs) you know, like laugh, (laughs) throw our heads back and just laugh hysterically because it was like, it doesn't stay this way. So, Mm. but I didn't understand what happened between party ready and back to total disaster. And now I get it, you know, now you get it. So you have made the transition. Now your home is not perfect. No, not perfect, Um, but, but picked up a majority of the time and you have older kids. Yes. Yeah. So, so here's the thing is it, it started with the daily habits, which made no sense to me before, because I always thought I needed to get my house under control before I started any kind of maintenance. Okay. Um, It just only made sense to me. Cause logically that is the way you would think. Um, but in reality, because I was so desperate, I was like, I don't know how other people's kitchens are not constantly a disaster. So I'm just going to start doing my dishes every day. And that changed everything. Like huh. those daily things are ultimately what changed my home was doing those things daily. You know, I'm going to ask. Yes, go ahead. What are the daily things? So the daily things are dishes first. If you can't do anything else, do the dishes. I call it dishes math because one day's worth of dishes only takes 15 minutes, but I never knew that because I never did one day's worth of dishes. I always thought, well, that's not worth my time to do those few dishes. I'll wait until, you know, it's worth my time. And then I would wait and then it would be overwhelming. And then I'd have to wait longer. And then we were out of dishes. And so by the time I did the dishes, it was several hours worth. So like one day is the 15 minutes, two days is an hour. 
three days is like four hours because then you're completely having to excavate the kitchen. Did you have like a certain time of day? Like you always started the day doing the previous day's dishes or do you just recommend people pick what works for them? When you get started, I recommend you just say, I'm going to get the dishes done at some point today. Like, because it's different for everybody. Everybody has a different routine. I personally have found, and this does work for the majority of people. My goal is to run my dishwasher every night. Yeah. Like if I will do that, even if the kitchen is not all the way clean, that will keep things from piling up and backing up and it will keep things under control. So doing that, the second task, I mean, the second daily, yeah, I call them habits, but they're not really habits because I always thought habits were things where you um, didn't realize you were doing it. And I will always realize that I'm doing these things. Like it's, it's like never a going to be chosen <laughs> activity, like yeah, on I call the them list. pre-made decisions. Like okay. I don't have to make this decision every day. I know this needs to be done. So the yeah. other is sweeping the kitchen okay. because that's about seeing the kitchen, like instead of just living my life and not realizing there are newspapers on the floor or shoes or whatever, it's like combats that. Um, and then checking the bathrooms for clutter, not wiping them down, just literally like checking them for clutter so that then when it is time to clean, I don't have to first like declutter, you know? Um, and then the other one that is, these are the two like dishes and this are the two that will change everything. And that's, is the five minute pickup. The five minute pickup is everything. And it's the best one to involve your kids in as well. And I don't recommend that you set a certain time of day to do it because as a mom, when I would set a time to do it and say, I'm going to do this, you know, right before bed, well, then I would forget. And then the next day I'd be like, Oh, I was going to do that before bed. Okay. Tonight, tonight, tonight. And then I would forget again because it wasn't part of our routine and my kids were not about to remind me, you know? So I just realized, Oh, okay. I'm just going to go ahead and do this in the moment when I think about it, even if my kids aren't around, I'm going to do it myself. And then when I do that, somehow I'm more likely to remember to do it again. And there's always enough to do it again. You know, so that five minute pickup will truly change your house. That's good. Yeah. So do you have any specific dailies that might help a mom this summer? If she's looking at the summer, there's a, I mean, I feel like it's hard with the pandemic because everyone's story is so unique. I know some, their kids have been in school every day, away from home this whole year, and now they're going to be home for summer. Others, they have been home since last March, and the summer is just an extension of already being home, and so there's no real, except for not having to do online school, right? It almost might be easier, but for me, it's like there are a lot more people around the house all day eating all the things. I mean, it's the dishes. It, it really is. I, you know, and there are some people who are like, oh, people don't do their dishes. There's people in the world that don't do their dishes every single day. And I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of us. Um, so, but yeah, like focusing on that. And the, the key to that is yes, your kitchen is the most functional or needs to be the most functional place in your house, or you can't do the things that you need to do. Like you just mentioned people eating all the time. Yeah. You know, I have two teenage boys. Yeah. They both love to cook. I mean, oh, that's, well, that's great helpful. and wonderful, yeah. mm-hmm. but they don't always clean up their messes, you know, whatever. So it's, it's that constant focusing on the dishes so that that space that has to be functional is functional. And it really does change the entire house when you focus on that. And then the other key to that is just knowing where to start, because it's a very real thing to look around your whole house and go, Oh my goodness. How did this happen again? What am I going to do? I've got to change every method I've ever tried has failed, blah, blah, blah. If you will just know that when I'm overwhelmed, do the dishes. There's nothing to think about. It's just that, oh my goodness, what's happened? Do the dishes and you're going to be fine. Like it is an active thing that you can immediately do that will then, you know, lead you to the other stuff. Or if, if it doesn't, like if you quit after the dishes, your dishes are done in your house is better. Yeah, I like that because like you said, that paralyzing Mm -hmm. of the whole thing feels so overwhelming. That's the whole barrier to entry is I don't know where to start. So that starts the momentum. And then if they want to sweep the kitchen, yeah, there's like more momentum. And then they could do the five minute pickup. And then there's a little momentum. Like those three things could be good momentum. How have you involved your kids in the process? Like when did you start them in this, like you mentioned the five minute pickup, but like, do they have jobs or chores or? So I have, my kids are teenagers, so they are very busy. Um, but we have been at this for, you know, 10 years. So 
it changes with every phase of life. There's not like a, oh, okay, we've got this figured out. Usually you get something figured out and it works great for a couple months and yeah. then everybody's schedule changes and you're yeah. like, oh, well that we have to change something. So just <laughs> know that that's reality. Like there isn't some magical thing. It's the, we're going to make this work for right now. The number one thing that I recommend that happened for me is I, because when in the beginning, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing, even my family, I had to focus on what I was doing and what I wasn't doing. And I saw such a huge impact in my home as I focused on habits and on decluttering. And I realized, oh yeah, it is harder when you have kids. It is harder when you live in a family with, you know, in a home with a family because there's other people's stuff and other people's emotions and other people's motivation and all that kind of stuff. So yes, it's harder, but at the same time, I want them there. You know, I mean, like, I'm glad they're here. And so, but I I think because it's harder, it's easy to place blame on them when in reality it fell on me, you know? And so when I started making changes, I also realized I had established what was normal in our home. And what was normal in our home was that there was no routine. You know, it was that I would wait until I thought I needed to do the dishes, which was when we were drinking out of measuring cups or whatever. You know I mean? Like this was, (laughs) I mean, this was just how it was. And I had to accept that responsibility. And the main thing that I say for moms is we are managers. Like Mm -hmm. if you go into a fast food restaurant and there's a bunch of teenagers working there and I love teenagers, just so you know, I've got three of them. I love them, but if you walk in and it's dirty and whatever, and you know, your food takes forever, who do you blame? You blame the manager, right? Because the manager is supposed to establish expectations and is supposed to assign people what they're supposed to be doing that day. And is supposed to oversee them and is supposed to hold them accountable and all that. That's what we have to do. I mean, like I, how old are your kids? 15 down to nine. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and my husband's big on like having roles for everybody. Like this is your role. I did a zone concept for a season. Like you get the living room, you get the kitchen table and counters, you get the dining room, you get the Lego room is what we call it, but mm-hmm. like playroom. And we would have like your 15 minute pickup, but you do your zone. Yes. And so they kind of took ownership of that space. And then it was a little bit easier. Um, I also find when they're a part of it, they are more careful with their messes Mm -hmm. when it's a consistent thing. Yeah. And that, that five minute pickup is it. Honestly, the other thing to remember with a five minute pickup is once your kids actually know how to do it and believe that you really mean it. Okay. And you're not just going to give up because in the beginning, they're going to pretend like they don't know where anything goes. You know I mean? That's just reality. But once they finally do that, it's like, we can do a 25 minute pickup of our house in five minutes when we have five people working, you know, so that's a huge impact and we can get our house basically under control picked up wise in that amount of time, you know, and then over the years we do different things. One summer we said, I said, okay, you guys are going to have assigned days where you help me through the laundry process. And then as they got older, it was okay. You're on your own for laundry in the summer. And you know, all this, so it's just teaching them, acknowledging that my job is to teach them because I think one of the frustrations can be when I'm like, how do they not know this stuff? And I'm like, well, it's my job to teach them, you know, so I bring (laughs) them in. It works better to bring them in on whatever I'm already doing as a routine. But when you go from no routine to, Hey, everybody, we're going to change everything and how we've done everything for your entire life starting now. Okay. (laughs) Now, you know, like that doesn't work. But I I think that if whoever's listening, your life is shifting for summer, because I think traditionally these are great seasons to try new things. It could be a good season to try something new or teach a skill how to clean a toilet or teach them how to do the dishes. I think it was last summer that we would did the ticketing system um, where they would earn tickets by doing different jobs. And like I bought a mop, a really cool mop that like power tool mop. So they were fighting over who got to do it. But like that concept, like then teaching them how to mop the floor. Summer can be a good time because unless you have a ton of camps, you have a little bit more space to teach and you're not rushing to get somewhere and doing homework and doing sports. And, and with the camps thing, I think part of my issue back when, 
like the summer before I started the blog, when I had really just hit rock bottom, I had done a big old like, okay, we're going to do this. Here's a chart. Here's a system. (laughs) And then VBS happened, you know, like we did great for one week and then VBS, and then there was a family vacation and then there was this and it, and I have learned that it goes better to just say, okay, this is what I would normally do today. You're going to help with that. We're going to do this as a family because we're all home. It's all of our house, you know, so this is your job. This is your job. This is your job as opposed to big plans from the beginning. (laughs) Well, those short charts never worked for me because it seemed like it was a lot of weight on me. It is. Even if I tell them you need to go mark it off or whatever. I'm just, and I'm sure certain personalities do this differently, just like all of this, like the ones who are listening. Oh, absolutely. Who have this figured. They're not even, they've probably stopped listening to the whole episode. They're like, I've got this whole thing figured out. But for the rest of us, that this is a struggle and we're like, really, we want a system. We want to do this better. And it just doesn't come naturally. I think them checking out your podcast and you have books and you have courses, I'm sure. I mean, point them to like, what would be the next best step if they identify with everything you're saying and they want more support in it? I would recommend the books just because um, that's where it's got the whole process of mindset changes, what to actually do in your home, how to change how you think about it, how to change your actions. So the first one um, is called how to manage your home without losing your mind. That one focuses on the routines and also has decluttering in it because decluttering like your house will be easier to manage once you get it even partially decluttered with every single thing that leaves your house, your house will be easier to keep under control. So there's that. And then decluttering at the speed of life has my five-step decluttering process that works in any, like the whole point of it is that you make progress and only progress. So distractions happen. Like when you're a mom, you're never going to put yourself in a worse situation. Like you never pull everything out of a space and then somebody starts bleeding and then it's worse than it was before. And you just shove it back in. And then it's, you know, I mean, like, you know, that's just reality. A lot of unfinished decluttering processes going on in your house right now. It's like, so I'm not a finisher. I'm definitely a starter. And Outside of phase of life, like that's just See, who you, I am. Right. I, need your I mean, book. you need I my need your process yeah, because yeah. that mm-hmm. was me. Is that that like okay? I'm going to change today, and then <laughs> life continues to happen. And so it's like I had to come up with a way to make progress and only progress, which means that if I have five minutes. I can go ahead and get started on this space because I'm only going to make progress. And then sometimes that turns into 30 minutes and that I can make a ton of progress. But even if it's only two minutes, because I get distracted into, you know, two minutes in, I've still only made progress. Do you ever feel like sometimes in order to eat cleanly or have non-toxic products in your home, you have to spend a fortune. Well, thankfully, I have found Thrive Market and I can save so much money on my orders because of their online membership based market. And their mission is to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. They even give away a membership, it's a one for one matching program. So every paid membership sponsors one for a low income family, which I love that mission. What's great is Thrive Market works directly with your favorite organic brands, so you get the highest quality products without the retail markups. I have loved getting dog treats for Charlie on there. I love searching by diets and values like keto, gluten-free, vegan, non-GMO, fair trade, and recently put in a whole order for a lot of non-toxic cleaning supplies so I could clean our home without worry of adding extra chemicals. If you wanna go check them out, go to thrivemarket.com slash DMA, all caps, join today and you're gonna get $20 off your first order and a free gift. That's thrive, T-H-R-I-V-E, market.com slash DMA to get $20 off your first order and a free gift. thrivemarket.com slash DMA. Do you want to talk about decluttering or are we out of time? I would talk to you for days. I'm <laughs> if you, I mean, okay, so we're hoping to move and we've lived in our house for 18 years. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. 18 years. 
four children. There's a lot of stuff. And I have, you know, yeah, been purging over time. There, it's right. not like I've kept everything we've ever bought for that 18 years. But it is an overwhelming task. When I look at a space, let's take the closet under my stairs, and I see crafting things, and I see holiday things, and I see uniforms, and just so much stuff. Mm-hmm. Paralyzation. Paralysis? Paralyzation is not a thing. Yeah. Paralysis is. So I just stop, and I'm like, I can't. Okay. Do you want to know what to do? I do. Tell me. (laughs) Okay. That was every space in my home. Like, so, you know, like this whole me having to just figure it out and not, I mean, in the beginning, I had no intention of anyone ever learning from me. Like that was, I was always like, why are people asking me questions about decluttering and organizing and home stuff? Because like, I'm the last person to talk about this stuff. So it was a real, you think like me versus the ones who do it easily. Don't think like me. Right. And that's what I always say is I'm like, most organizing advice is written by organized people, which makes sense. They like talking about this stuff. I don't think that way. And so I would read traditional organizing books and I was lost on page three. I was like, what are you even, what? This this all brings me joy. Sure. I don't know. Hold it up again. (laughs) Oh, hold it like a taco. I don't know. I I mean, to do here, I can't. And and that's part my process. I had to remove emotions because if you ask me if I want something or if I could use it, or if there's a purpose for, I'm like, oh yes, I can come up with a reason. Why else would it be in my house if I didn't want it at some point? So so true. It's so true. I get the creativity, the creativity. It's like, oh, this could be used for that. Well, I mean, and along those lines, that was actually the thing that was a huge shift for me. So I said, I called myself a slob in the beginning. And this was the part of me that I hated that I'd always hidden from people. And I, I did start to have people read my blog because I wanted to know about blogging. So I wasn't telling anybody I knew, but I was like, you know, linking up to blog parties and stuff like we used to do in those days. And people would start to read it and they were like, oh my goodness, this is exactly me. Like, these are the thoughts that run through my head. I didn't know. I always thought I was the only one. And I was like, wait, there's other people like me, you know? And as I learned things about these people, the common thread was creativity. Hmm. that was the thing. They were poets and artists and lots of theater arts teachers, which is what I did before I had kids. You know what I mean? So it's like all this common thread of creativity. So I realized that this is how my brain works. Like this is part of who I am. So this slob part of me that I'd always hated is actually directly related to the creative part of me, which is the part of me that makes me say to God, thank you so much for making me the way you made me, you know, and and to realize there's a relationship there helped me accept that this is who I am, which doesn't mean I go, oh, well, my house is always going to be messy. Instead, it makes me realize that's why all this organizing advice written by organized people didn't work for me because our brains work differently. Yes. And so it gave me permission to figure out what does work for me. And, well, and that so what was do I need to do? Shift. So I see my space and I'm this creative person. What do I do? Okay. So you need a black trash bag. Oh, it needs okay. to be black so that the people in your house cannot see what you're putting inside of it. <laughs> Grab your black trash bag yeah. and start throwing away trash literally start throwing away trash. Even if you are absolutely convinced there is no trash, just say that Dana lady told me to throw away trash. I'm just going to look for trash and prove that she's wrong. I'm not wrong. You're going to find trash. Okay. Okay. Because clutter collects random stuff, including trash. Um, but it might be packaging. It might be receipts. It might be, uh, you know, whatever, but it might be empty Amazon boxes. I don't know, but start throwing away trash. If you have a recycling routine already established, bring that into and just do that because what that does, number one, it gets you moving, which breaks that paralysis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it also helps you start to look at this overwhelming mass of stuff as individual items where before it was stuff. It was a pile. Mm. Now it is a stack of paper and some scissors and whatever, you know, like it's individual things. books. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with every item that leaves, it diminishes the overall volume of the mess, which diminishes your feeling of being overwhelmed. Okay. Yeah. And so as you do that, you're putting stuff in a trash bag, which means if you put three things in the trash bag, you have successfully decluttered. You're not done, but stuff is gone. 
Yeah. And so it has less, which means you've been successful. You could step away at any time and you have not made anything worse. It's also zero emotion. Like there are no decisions to make. It's literal, actual trash. If you find yourself going, well, is this trash or not? (laughs) Skip that and move to something that's obvious, actual trash. I love that. And then step two is easy stuff, which is anything that already has an established home somewhere else in your house. It's just not there for whatever reason. So there's no questions to ask yourself. There are no decisions to make. There's nothing to analyze. It's literally, why is the dog's water dish in my craft room? Like that (laughs) is, and whether or not you want to, you know, go on and on and tell yourself, why do I do that? No, we're not doing that. It's just like, literally take it there right now. Yeah. And then we're supposed to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Take it where it goes right now so that when you get distracted, you haven't made piles of stuff to take later. It's one thing is gone and that space is better than it was before. So you keep moving through that. So at this point, you, which once you get your house mostly decluttered and then you think, oh, I've got to declutter this space again, you are generally done after those two steps because it was really just random stuff that ended up in this space. But even when it's a totally overwhelming storage space that's been there for 12 years or whatever, and you haven't touched it, it still works. So move easy stuff, take it to its home that you don't have to think about and you don't have to figure out what its home is. You just already know it. And then third is to just get rid of the clutter, which means the stuff that doesn't deserve any kind of decluttering questions. So like there's nothing to analyze your, and, and this step can happen at any point. I just like to put it in there because Sometimes when people feel inept at decluttering, and then I give you my decluttering questions, which are the next step, they think that they need to ask that question about every single thing. And that Mm. slows you down where there's going to be things where you're like, oh my word, I had this lamp in college and I didn't even like it then. And I stuck it under the, you know, I mean, like all yeah. these, there's yeah, going like, to be This is useless like, now. Yeah. Like there's yeah. no point to keep this. So yes. it's just giving yourself permission, okay. not saying that you're going to even necessarily find a bunch of that stuff, but just giving yourself permission to stick it in your donate box. By the way, your donate box needs to be donatable. Don't stencil the word donate on the outside of a box because then you're going to want to keep it, which means you're going to have to go back through it. And if you have to go back through it, then- you're going to second guess yourself. So So a donate box, that's just like a large Amazon box that I don't care if I take it straight to the place and the things that go in it are useful for someone else. Yes, exactly. Because you've already gotten rid of trash, right? Okay. Trash went in the trash bag. This is stuff that's going to be donated. So then Mm -hmm. you move on. So at that point, even if you stop at any point during there, you've made your space better. Yeah. And the more often you do that, the more you start to realize it is worth it when I'm overwhelmed to look at a space and just start throwing away trash, just look for trash. And that space is going to be better. And that is going to make it less overwhelming, which means the next time I go, there might only be two pieces of trash instead of 15 pieces of trash. And then I'll be able to move to easy stuff more quickly, you know, and then you'll move through the process more easily. And then I have my decluttering questions, which is for the stuff that you're like, I know it doesn't go here but I don't know where it goes you know? <laughs> Um, And those are, if I needed this item, where would I look for it first? So it's an instinct based mm. question. It has nothing to do with my emotions. Yeah. It is literally, if I needed this item, where would I look first? If I was going where are the dog treats, which I feel like, have I mentioned several dog things? It's because I have my dog treats right there. And I think that <laughs> it's just like your brain is the first thing it's seeing. It yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yes. But I'm like, where's the dog treats? Where's the first place where I would go to look for them? That's that good. is their home. So like this idea, which was me of, you know, knowing that all the organized people said that there has to be a place for everything. And I was like, but I don't have a place for everything. I don't know where things should go. That answers that question. Mm. Where would I look for it first? Which also solves the problem that a lot of people people run into when they organize, which is, well, I got organized and now I can't find anything, you know, like, oh, I have, I thought of some super logical place to put this. (laughs) And now I can't remember where that was, where if I ask myself the question, where would I look for this first and literally go with my instinct answer, then when I need that item and I look for it, it's going to be in the first place where I look for it. And Mm -hmm. that is like magic. I mean, that's, that's work, you know, that's being organized, even though I've really just decluttered. That's really so. Good. So yeah. And then it keeps going. And then the, if you can't answer that question, oh, and the other key to that is taking it there right now. Don't make piles for later because even though that feels more efficient, that's how you end up with a bigger mess, which then 
makes you not want to get started the next time. So go ahead and take, take things where they go. As soon as you have an answer to where you would look for it first and, um, you will make progress and only progress. Um, but if you can't answer that first question, the second one is if I needed this item, would it ever occur to me that I already had one? Um, Mm. because you didn't have an answer for where you would look for it first, because Mm. you probably wouldn't have even gone looking for it, which means you would have gone out and bought another one, which means you would have double and you're trying to, you know, so it's, it's that reality acceptance. Um, it's not necessarily everything that I didn't know I had it because if I didn't know I had it, but I would go looking for it, well, then it's in its home. But if I literally would never cross my mind to even look for it, I need to be honest and realize that I would have either bought another one and spent the money anyway, or, um, I would have done without, which is also a valid option. Oh, that's so good. And it's kind of personal. It's like, you know, me, it's like when you say, take it there immediately and don't make a pile. It's like, you're against my piles, like my, (laughs) my coping mechanism of piles, like sure. That's organized, right? If it's a pile. No, I totally think that's an amazing tips and so helpful for me, honestly, truly like it. I feel a little bit like I can actually do this task ahead of me. Well, and even if you don't get to the decluttering questions, yeah, you will have made your space better and less overwhelming if all you do is trash and easy stuff. And then you get down to where you're like, this is better. I'm feeling yeah. better about this space and take it before picture and then delete it before your mother-in-law is flipping through your phone. But anyway, <laughs> but like take it before picture. And then when you do have to step away or when you're just like, I'm done, I can't do any more today, take another picture and flip back and forth between them. And you're going to be amazed at the visual impact of just doing easy, non-emotional stuff that then gets you to the point where you are really purging down to the limits of the space that you have available. It's really good. Dana, you're, you're really wise. And I love that you are one of us. (laughs) You're one of us. You're a slob like us. (laughs) Um, well, there's a lot of us out there. Okay, good. (laughs) Well, thank you. Okay. Well, I want people to connect with you and learn more and more from you. So what site would they go to? And we'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah. So they can go to a slob comes clean.com. That is where everything is housed. And I mean, of course I'm everywhere. I usually take the summers off, but, um, this year, my 17 year old is my YouTube manager now, and he doesn't want to lose his job for the summer. So I'm going to keep doing YouTube videos. It's been like 10 years since I've worked in the summer, but Wow. YouTube videos. Oh yeah. We've been doing them since January. So it's been a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. I've been amazed. Yeah. Have your son do it too. I need to give, that's what my 15 year old needs to do this year. Very smart. Well, I'm encouraged by you. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm just love that I got to meet you. Well, it's been really fun. So since recording this episode, I did declutter under the stairs. I did a ton of decluttering actually across our home uh, because we were having painters come. We had a party for Bruce and then we're getting new carpet. And I was really thankful that I had Dana's advice of how to start. And it really is true that if you start with the trash, it goes a little bit easier. And um, I'm really hoping that you felt encouraged with this episode and that you will just continue to follow her, get her books, listen to her podcast if you're someone who could relate to the struggles of not being able to organize easily. Um, I want to pray over us and our things and our summers. Lord, I thank you that you have given us spaces, spaces to dwell in, spaces to care for, people to care for. I pray that you would help give us the perspective of taking care of these things and to release the burden or any lies of identity that tell us anything other than who you made us to be. I pray that we would find a great balance of taking care without um, idolizing the things we have or beating ourselves up that we're not doing enough. I pray for moms who are struggling to balance meeting the needs of a lot of children who are home and um, wanting to be entertained, also having to balance careers and friendships and all that is on their plate. 
I pray that you would give them eyes to see what matters in the moment and to really be present. I know, Lord, for me, that is hard to be fully present in the midst of all the things pulling for our attention. I pray most of all that we would center in our hearts and our minds on you, that you would give us eyes to see what you have for us today and how it differs from those around us, that we wouldn't be distracted with the plans you have for us today, and that we could sit with you in your presence and know there's nothing we have to do to earn your love, that we are already loved by you. And from that, we can just be good stewards of all that we've been given. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I've mentioned the summer of mentorship. I've gotten some emails with questions. Basically, here, wherever you listen to your podcast, whether whatever podcast player, we're going to have republished episodes pop up into your feed week one through week six. Now, you have the choice if you want to gather some gals in your community and meet up once a week to talk about that week's episode. We'll provide discussion questions or you can just listen like you normally do. You don't have to do anything extra, but we wanted to give it as an opportunity that if you wanted to get people together, you could do that, try out our podcast clubs for these six weeks. And um, there's nothing you need to do to sign up. If you want extra help, if you want um, a guide that helps you with how to lead discussions better and kind of some rules that you can kind of set up with your group so that you have more productive conversations, you can go sign up at don'tmomalone.com slash join. And when you put your email in there, you'll start to get emails with links to our Facebook groups and to where those documents are. Um, But that's just extra support if you do decide to lead a summer mentorship group. Otherwise, just join us here starting June 21st. And in the show notes today for this episode, we have a little graphic if you want to share that with friends um, or on your social media, feel free to use that. All right, I'll see you back here next week. We're going to talk about technology with Arlene Pelican. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more people and more resources to help remind you that you're not alone, head over to don'tmomalone.com. That's where you'll also find show notes with any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I want you to know the good news the great news that you're not alone because God has promised to always be with you. With faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, Jesus said when he left, he was going to leave a helper, a comforter to be with us. God in us, moms, that's superpower. So while you're washing dishes at your kitchen sink, while you're driving to and from work, while you're feeding that baby late into the night, while you're cleaning sticky floors, God promises to be just as present with you as when you're worshiping in a church pew. As it says in Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now that's good news. Have a great day.